The state will plan a perfect economy in which each person works the minimal amount necessary and everyone receives what they need. Everyone will have their time freed up so they can write epic poetry and paint beautiful pictures, leading to a grand explosion in culture and ushering in a utopia on Earth. This fantasy version of communism is something that a lot of Americans could spot, especially conservatives. It's something that they've been trained to knock down. They inherently understand it doesn't work, even if it's a bit of a straw man. The point is, they would immediately say, this is just not how humanity works. This is just not reality. But according to political theorist Carl Schmitt, liberalism has a similar fantasy that we in the West have learned to treat as if it's reality. Understand that when we're going to be discussing liberalism in this video, we're not talking about the American context of the word liberal. We're not talking about progressive Democrats. We're talking about the more classical definition of liberal. We're talking about the idea that the political leadership of a country should be selected through a liberal democratic process of debate and elections. Schmidt suggests that the idea that a large group of people with significant variance in values and in cultures can come together and debate things and work out all of their differences through a, an exchange of ideas is on its face a fantasy. Schmidt points out that any political belief that would threaten the existence of a group is, by its definition, non-negotiable for that group. And Schmidt believes that these kind of beliefs being held by groups is very common. It happens all the time. Having been trained in Western liberal ideology, we tend to think of these kinds of disagreements as non-existential. We don't think of them as a threat to the existence of cultures or peoples, but Schmidt says these things absolutely exist and are constantly a issue of conflict between different groups. And because these disagreements that often threaten the existence of a group are so common, Schmidt believes this is when the friend-enemy distinction is born. Schmidt does not see the political as some kind of separate realm where debates about public policy take place but instead as a state that any disagreement about fundamental aspects of group identity can reach, be they religious, economic, or anything else, really. As soon as an aspect of a group's identity starts making a friend-enemy distinction, declaring some people friends and some people enemies, it has stopped being just what it is and is now, in addition, political. A religion or an economic system that has declared some people enemies and some people friends stops being just about theology, stops just being about economics, and is now inherently political. For Schmidt, the friend-enemy distinction is the fundamental distinction of the political, and any other distinctions that might exist when forming groups is subordinate to the friend-enemy distinction. Differences in opinion may exist inside the friend coalition that is opposing the enemy, but everyone who has been identified as friend does not threaten the core story that is vital to the continued existence of the group. According to Schmidt, liberalism promises to remove the friend-enemy distinction, essentially removing politics from the political. It attempts to achieve this by putting on a fantasy, a show of civil debates and disagreements where people in nice suits stand up in front of TV cameras, delivering speeches about how differences will be overcome and consensus will be reached. But Schmidt believes you cannot remove the politics from the political, and in the end, this is all just window dressing for the continued battle between friend and enemy that goes on behind the scenes. Despite the comforting fiction about the marketplace of ideas letting the best ideas come to the forefront and then be adopted by society, Schmidt says that the friend-enemy distinction simply continues to function. I think there are actually a lot of really obvious examples of the friend-enemy distinction that is currently operating inside the Western world while we pretend that issues are being discussed and debated in a liberal, democratic manner. The intellectual dark web is a collection of center, center-left, and even progressive public intellectuals. They came together in an effort to encourage dialogue of the type that we believe is fundamental in Western liberal democracies. 
But what these newly minted members of the IDW found is no matter how serious their leftist credentials, no matter how invested they were in progressive causes, if they began in any way to question the foundation of the woke ideology that had become the driver of the progressive movement, they were now on the outside. They were being accused of being some kind of far-right sympathizer, some kind of gateway to misogynistic and racist politics. It really didn't matter if they believed in single-payer health care. It didn't matter if they were on board with 99% of the feminist movement, if they were unwilling to protect the core story that had become important and fundamental to the identity of the group, they were now the enemy. The same can easily be seen when it comes to the TERFs, the trans-exclusionary radical feminists. Again, on board with almost all of the feminist and leftist rhetoric. In fact, they were often people who created and popularized exactly that rhetoric, and still, as soon as they showed resistance, as soon as they showed an inflexibility, as soon as they showed a principle that was no longer compatible with the movement that they themselves had helped to found, they were now tossed out. Even groups like the ACLU, which for many years stood on principle defending the rights of people like the KKK to march as they insulted different minority groups because they thought it was important to protect the First Amendment, are now basically openly calling for censorship and want to see a narrowing of the rights that they once believe existed under the First Amendment. At the end of the day, despite its name, the ACLU knows who their friends are and who their enemies are. And they are happy to shift the principles that they said they believed and defended in public for many decades if it's necessary to protect their position inside the friend coalition. I firmly believe that one of the reasons that Trump is so dangerous to the left is that he's the first GOP politician in a very long time to understand the friend-enemy distinction at a very instinctual level. Catholics, evangelicals, the NRA, the prison reform crowd, Trump doesn't care. If he can form the friendly coalition, he does, to oppose the enemy. It's really that simple. Schmidt believed that liberalism ultimately attempts to remove identity in order to reduce competition for the friend-enemy distinction. It pushes relentlessly towards globalization and homogenization across borders in pursuit of its goal to remove these identities. But in the end, Schmidt says, this is impossible. Schmidt also says that the ultimate political sovereignty resides in being able to declare the friend-enemy distinction. The person or group of people who is able to declare friend and enemy, they hold the true power. If a group of any size, all the way up to a country, wants to abdicate its responsibility of declaring friend and enemy, someone else will assume power and leadership and take on that responsibility for themselves. In his essay, The Concept of the Political, Schmidt says the following, quote, The world will not thereby become depoliticized, and it will not be transplanted into a condition of pure morality, pure justice, or pure economics. If a people is afraid of the trials and risks implied by existing in the sphere of politics, then another people will appear which will assume these trials by protecting it against foreign enemies and thereby taking over political rule. The protector then decides who the enemy is by the virtue of the eternal relation of protection and obedience. If you enjoyed this video, go ahead and give it a like. As always, if you're new here and you haven't subscribed, now's a great time to do so. If you'd like to follow me on Twitter or support my work like Narco Republican does on Subscribestar, the links to do that are down below the video. And I'm always appreciative of anyone who is out there sharing my stuff on social media. It really helps the channel, guys. I appreciate you coming by and watching, and as always, I'll talk to you next time.